Amen. So we are in lesson 23, believe it or not, uh, Daniel chapter 3, and this teaching will be available here on the Facebook page, but also on the YouTube later, so if y'all want to share it, or if you're watching on YouTube, hi, just want to give you a shout out and thank you for checking in there. Uh, the title for this teaching is Unshaken When the Outcome Looks Iffy at Best. Iffy is a word I made up, I-F-F-Y. Uh, it, that means that, that sometimes in life we don't know how things are going to go. We, we kind of put all of our eggs in a basket and we hope for something to work out and we're going to see these three men who put their eggs in the only basket that has uh, uh, that you can put your confidence in and they saw uh, God come through for them in an incredible way and so uh, we're going to get into the teaching in a minute uh, if you uh, are in this uh, series or you've watched it for some time we have spent 22 weeks already today's week 23 talking about how to stand unshaken strong in faith no matter what we started the series right around the time shortly after we started this community and I think this will take us through the end of sort of middle of December and the next year we're going to do some foundational teachings in what it means to be a Christian and how to identify your spiritual gifts and how to fight spiritual warfare just a lot of great things coming up next year but for now we're making our way sort of through the Bible not through every single book but we're stopping uh, it, bit by bit and we're covering ground and today we're in the book of Daniel chapter 3 last week we talked about Daniel in the book of Daniel chapter 1 and he was sort of the essence the central person in our in our story and there were three men that I mentioned that we're going to be talking about today so I'm going to read you a bit of scripture a chunk of scripture maybe you've read it already uh, I think it sets the tone for where we're going with this the king now this just to put you in some context King Nebuchadnezzar is the Babylonian king who has already besieged Jerusalem Jerusalem is no more God had predicted that to the people of Israel it was as a punishment to uh, all of the way that all of their um, stubbornness their hard heartedness over really centuries and God had given them chance after chance to repent and they had not repented and so God said listen he he he, he allowed them to go in a period of great suffering where their uh, their entire country was was taken over by the Babylonian Empire they were put into uh, captivity and in those 70 years of captivity though God that's a long time by the way 70 years though God allowed them in that season of 70 years to grow to build houses to become part of the community which is what we see Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego do yet those 70 years were not meant to be forever they were just meant to be a period of time in which God would draw the hearts of the people back to himself and then Ezra would lead the people back to Jerusalem and then Nehemiah would lead the people back to Jerusalem and there would be a revival and then 400 years of silence before the New Testament and pretty soon here I I think maybe next week I, I don't remember the next lesson but but pretty soon we're going to be jumping into the New Testament but for now we're towards the end chronologically of the Old Testament with the story of these three men Shadrach Meshach and Abednego who are partners in crime or, or in faith with Daniel who was uh, who's the the hero of, of the book of Daniel actually Jesus is always the hero of every book but Daniel is the guy who who's sort of the, the this book is written about and so here in chapter 3 we get a perspective of these three men a story that happens and and that's about all that we ever hear about these three men except for chapter one that we talked about last week we get chapter one we see that they make a resolve with Daniel not to eat meat and then we see them in chapter three and here's the story King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold so this is verse one whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth six cubits he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the leaders, basically. He lists them all um, to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. This is crazy. By the way, a little bit prophetic, like sort of this I am and no one else, right? This leader who thinks all of himself. And so this guy, Nebuchadnezzar, made an idol of himself and he wanted everybody to bow down to that idol. All right. Now. It says, then the satraps in verse three, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that King that, that Nebuchadnezzar had set up and the herald, that's the trumpeter, proclaimed aloud, you are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the word of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the hornpipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshiped the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So, so far, 
which is here. This is a crazy king. He wants everybody to worship him. He makes this, this, this idol. And over in their neck of the woods, it says, therefore, verse 8, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. There was a handful of Jews that had been taken captivity from Jerusalem. So their eye was on these people because remember at the end of chapter 2 of Daniel last week, we talked about how because of Daniel's interpretation of the dream, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were given prominent leadership positions in the kingdom. And so these Chaldeans were jealous of them. And so verse 9, it says, the Chaldeans, they declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall and worship shall be cast into a burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar in furious rage commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answers and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? So he gives them the benefit of the doubt. These were men that he had assigned to lead certain provinces. Is it true? And then verse 15. Now, if you are ready, he's like, I'm going to give you one more chance. He's like, now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And now he ends it with this. And who is this God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, and I think the NLT uses the famous words that I think Casting Crown or one of those groups made a song after, y'all can correct me which one it is, but, the, but in the NLT it says, but even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, even if he doesn't, even if, but if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Say, what was Nebuchadnezzar's response? It says, Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the fi burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. So they're wrapped their wrists there in the furnace. And, and the king thinks that he has been vindicated. It says in verse 24, Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, true, O king. He answered and said, but I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. This is incredible. Verse 26, then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not had any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads were not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his service, who, listen, who trusted, underline it, circle it, who trusted in him he, and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other god who is able to rescue in this way. 
Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Why, why do I read this entire passage? I think sometimes we assume people know the story. But the more I read statistics on, on what we know as Christians and how many minutes we spend in the Bible in the course of a year, I guarantee you there are some people who are listening to the story tonight who have never heard it before. You might think it's a story, a fairy tale, unreal, and yet it is in the Word of God. It is in, in, in this spirit-breathed Word of God given to us for a reason. In Romans 15, chapter 4, we've established that the stories of the Old Testament are given to us to learn certain principles. You see, what are we learning in the story? This is a simple story of three men who had a choice, and that choice could have been very easy. They could have just been like, no big, we'll bow before the king it's just a second nobody will notice we're already prisoners here you know no one will care we can bow with our knees but our hearts is the god almighty's they could have had so many ways to justify their actions but instead they stood their ground and they decided that too much was at stake here and they made a decision that would cost them almost their life they were thrown in the fiery furnace only to be saved by god now i want us to go over some application points with this title unshaken when the outcome looks iffy at best when we start the story, we don't know how this is going to turn out. Just because you and I might be familiar with the story doesn't mean that they knew where this was going. As far as they were concerned, the outcome was iffy at best. Right now, in 2020, we are walking through what my nephew Sam would call the valley of the shadow of death. We're walking through sort of a season where we really are not sure how things are going to turn out. We don't know who's going to win the election. I don't care what the polls tell you. We don't know how COVID is going to turn out. Is there a vaccine that's going to come or not? We don't know if we're ever going to live in a culture where we don't wear masks. We don't know our outcome right now. We don't know how the church will, will turn up after we go back to churches. Will people show up or have they been habituated to this new normal? What will happen in every one of our lives? There's a set of questions where we are not sure the outcome is iffy at best. And in that season, in that space, God is asking us like Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego to make certain decisions that will allow us to stand unshaken, resolute in the knowledge, not that we can be strong, but that God is strong on our behalf and that even if we end up in the fiery furnace he will be right there with us furthermore I, let me add he is right in it with you right now some of you are feeling like you are in a fiery furnace let me stop and say even before we go any further jesus is with you he has promised to never leave us nor forsake us if you have given your life jesus god is everywhere first of all but if you have given your life to him as lord of your life then there is not a space there's not a marriage there's not a job there's not a city there's not a country you might be watching this from a country that bans christianity and yet the lord jesus christ is with you and in you if you have given your life to him that is a promise in scripture but here's three principles out of this teaching number one your decision to obey god is best made so so when the outcome is if at best you're gonna have to decide if you're gonna obey god or man you're gonna have to make that decision your decision to obey god is best made before you get to a point of crisis this is critical what I love about this, the book of Daniel, okay, we don't meet Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. We don't know a lot about them, but we know enough to know that they were taken prisoners. They were part of that group of, of leaders, the cream of the crop, that were going to be brainwashed by Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 1. And when Daniel made the decision to stand strong, to resolve, to follow God's ways, they were the three young men who followed him. And so now we're in a point of crisis where this crazy king Nebuchadnezzar has this idol. He wants everybody to bow to him, and he's going to kill them if they don't. And before you say, man, it's... If I'm ever in that, I mean, we always, I think Christians always sort of theorize what would happen if, you know, I don't know if you grew up in the church, we grew up in thinking, oh, if I was ever asked to deny the Lord, I wouldn't, I would, I would, I would die for the sake of Christ. And it's so easy for us to make these big proclamations about the Lord. I spent so much time in the Middle East until this year. I've been traveling a lot and meeting a lot of converted Muslims who've given their lives to Jesus. And I've seen upfront and personal what it looks like to be truly persecuted, not persecuted by people just unliking you, unfollowing you, tweeting something bad about you, but true persecution where your lives, your family, your, 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 your everything about you is, is threatened to be destroyed and even killed for the sake of the gospel. Many of you watching know people and missionaries and families who have undergone some tremendous pressure because of the persecution due to their faith. But we think, man, if I'm in that situation, it'll be easy to follow Jesus. But what you and I fail to recognize and embrace is that the time to obey Jesus is now because your decision to obey God is made well before the crisis. If you cannot stand strong for your faith today, 
in the comfort of Mount Prospect, Illinois, in the comfort of wherever Tim, uh, 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 who was it who sent me? Like somewhere in Iowa watching tonight, y'all put the cities you were in and some of you are in the middle of nowhere. Literally, you're in the middle of nowhere and you think, man, it's all good here. But, but if you are not obeying God in the little things of your life, we go back to Daniel chapter 1, they resolved not to eat meat. Why was that a big deal? Because it was setting a tone of obedience in their life so that when the day would come where they would now face the king and the decision of who they would worship, it was an easy decision, this point of crisis, because it was, it was a decision made after many, many little decisions to obey God and not compromise. It reminds me of, we're not going to study Daniel 6, I don't believe, but it reminds me of Daniel 6 where, where Daniel prays three times a day and when he's threatened to be put in the lion's den, he wakes up in the morning despite the threat and he gets on his knees and he prays. Why? Because day after day, year after year, he had chosen to obey the Lord. And so your decision to obey God is made before you get to a point of crisis. Listen, it's made today. Today, some of you have to decide, will you obey God? Every day is an opportunity to decide what you will do with God and his word. Every day. Today, I just launched a, uh, we have this podcast and we had a pretty controversial uh, episode today that I think people have appreciated the approach to, but, but I talk about it in the context of sexuality. The title of the episode is, Is God Anti-Gay? And the premise of of, of, of how I address this is the same I would address to, to heterosexuals who are struggling with sexual sin and on and on and on. The question is always, what will you and I do with God and his word? If you're in a marriage right now, and there are things that you don't like about the person, are you? how are you going to approach your marriage? If you're in a, in a financial situation, are you gonna cut corners? Are you? Every day is an opportunity for us to decide what are we gonna do with God and his word? I had a conversation with a man yesterday who's gone through a heck of a trial the past two years. Lost a job, ended up quitting a job, but you know, faced almost financial ruin and in it he made a decision. I will continue to honor God with my giving, even though he wasn't bringing in an income. And God, he says, the more generously I live, the more God generously provided. Now God is always providing for us, but there is a, 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 a principle in scripture that if you live generously, God is going to honor that. And we can talk about that in a different time. But the point is, how are you obeying God today? When there's a gun to your head, when there's, when there's a, a person saying, deny God or die, you go, man, it'll be easy to follow him then. Really? Because if you can't make those decisions today, how do you think you're gonna make them tomorrow? Every day is an opportunity to reveal exactly what rules your heart. Is it the fear of man or is it the fear of God? Is it the pleasure of man and the approval of man or is it the approval of God? Just before I came on, I was browsing through Twitter and this pastor from LA wrote down, if you live for the approval of men, you will die by the criticism of men. Something like that. Isn't that the truth? So many of us are so destroyed when people tell us negative things because we're so dependent on what people think of us. What if we lived in a way like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that cared more about what God thinks of us than what the satraps and the governors and the leaders thought of us? Every day is a training ground. By the way, not just a decision point. Every day is actually a training ground to help you when the real test comes. Yeah, you might, you might be looking at your life and go, man, I'm not making good decisions. That's okay. You're in a training season right now. This is the chance to grow. It's like if you're training for the marathon, you know where your weaknesses are. You know where your pain is. You know where you need to stretch. This is the opportunity now where God is saying we're training for obedience. You're not in crisis yet. American Christians are so worried. What will happen? Will we be persecuted if so-and-so wins the election? Listen, today is a day for us to start growing in our ability to obey God so that when we, if we ever get to a situation where our faith and our, 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 our biblical beliefs are put to the test, we're okay. We're, we're not scrambling and fearful. You don't see Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego freaking out. They're unshaken strong in faith no matter what so your decision to obey god is best made before you get to a point of crisis here's the second big idea your decision to obey god might lead you into a fiery furnace i, I was naive in my early christian life even even as of 10 years ago i had and I, even now i catch myself i think we have this human way of thinking that that sort of assumes if i do my part then god will do his and we assume we, and by the way, God is still always doing his part and more. I mean, God is perfect. He's sovereign. But we have this idea that if I obey God, then he's 
obliged to keep me out of trouble. He is obliged to pour his favor on me in ways that I define, right? It's not even, I mean, he's always pouring his favor on us. His favor is in Jesus Christ. We're given eternity, his presence, and on, and on, and on. Ephesians chapter one. But we define what favor we want. And so we're constantly wrestling with disappointment with God because we come to him and go, man, God, I obeyed you and I'm in a fiery furnace. And so he plops Daniel three for us in the middle of scripture to remind us that sometimes obedience leads to suffering. That's not the worst thing that can happen to you and me. The obedience does not guarantee you to get the outcome that you want. Obedience doesn't always guarantee that you're going to get the outcome that you want. Obedience does not always lead to comfort. Obedience is not based on what God will do for me. We don't come to obedience and say, okay, God, I'm going to obey you if you fill in the blank. No, obedience is a response to who God is in my life. If you see God as sovereign and good and savior and rescuer, then it is nothing for you to give your life to him and to say, even if, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did, even if he doesn't save me from the fire first, I'm still living for him because I know who he is. See, that's obedience. And there are people who are, Jesus walks us through the valley of shadow of death, but we know, I mean, think about modern day missionaries. We know people like Jim Elliott, who I don't know how famous he still is now, but he gave his life to the Lord. He went to serve as a missionary and he was preaching the gospel to people who had never received the gospel when he was killed. He's not the only one. There are many, many Christians who have suffered the same fate. We look at them and go, what happened there? Did God blow it? Was he sleeping? <laughs> no, God was in control. God led him to the fiery furnace. And in the case of Jim Elliot, he came out of it on the heavenly side. We just assume salvation is human. If we don't get out of the fiery furnace, then that's not a good story. But it is a good story for Jim Elliot because he's in the heavens with the Lord. And what happened after he died? Well, his wife, Elizabeth Elliot, she didn't say okay god is that that's how you do well i'm out no elizabeth elliott would stay in the jungle prayed continued serving and she herself with some of the other missionary wives would end up going into the jungle and would tell the story of how the people who killed her husband came to know the lord jesus christ later i think nate saint who was one of the uh, other missionaries his wife and his kids they were part of that endeavor of of seeing the word of god grow and and, and it was like this classic the blood of the martyr is the seed of the faith and we saw that so much in that story you can buy that i think the book that she wrote through gates of splendor and tells the story of the jim elliott and elizabeth elliott and and how later Nate Saint's son wrote about how he himself ended up living there and i believe if i'm not wrong Nate Saint's son married somebody from the jungle and so to, to see the radical transformation that happened, that was the heart of Jim Elliot. That was what he had prayed for. And so we come to God with a preconceived agenda and expectations of what we think he should do so that if we land in a fiery furnace, we automatically assume that God is not good. And we might say the word, God, you're good, God, you're good, but in our hearts we wrestle. Perhaps for you tonight, maybe you are walking in a fiery furnace, and for you, maybe this story is a reminder that sometimes obedience still leads to suffering. I wrote a chapter on the cost of obedience and resolved my book. In fact, I'll, I'll go ahead and do this. Irina loves when I do this, but why don't I give away three copies of Resolved? If you have never read my book Resolved, Irina will ship them to you. You just email me your address. I think that chapter on obedience is so good. I'm, I'm, I'm not, look at, I'm not, I, I, people say that like you make a meal go, oh, my meal is so good. I, I don't mean that. I just really believe it'll challenge you and encourage you. And it holds these same ideas that are the biblical ideas that sometimes look, look no further than Jesus Christ. His obedience led him to the cross. He spent the night at Gethsemane. This is our savior, the captain of our suffering, the captain of our salvation. He was made perfect in suffering. He goes to Gethsemane, begs the Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass over me. And, and obediently, he walks down the road the next day to Golgotha. And he ends up hanging on a tree, according to God's will, so that you and I can today sit here and talk about him and have in our hearts, if you're like me, there's a, a longing, there's a tethering, there's a desire in our heart for more of him. Why? Because we, we see 
Maybe you don't know the Lord and you sense this, this thing in your life that's, you're like, I know my life, there's something missing. Listen, the person who's missing is Jesus Christ. He's given his life for you and he did it through suffering. So, <clears throat> sorry, your decision to obey God might lead you into a fiery furnace. Number three and we're, we're done. Your decision to obey God will always be met with God's faithful and abiding presence, all right? <clears throat> this is huge. Your decision to obey God will always be met with God's faithful and abiding presence. Whether you end up making it out of the fiery furnace on this side of heaven or not, God is with us. His presence is secure. He is with us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. That is a promise in Hebrews chapter 13. God's presence will always meet you in the middle of the fire. His presence will always help you make it through to the, the fire to the other side. And his presence will always be a witness to anyone watching of his great love and faithfulness to his people. What is magnificent about the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is that they were put into the fiery furnace bound and Jesus' presence frees them. They are no longer bound in the fiery furnace. They are walking in freedom in the middle of the fire. Why? Because the presence of Jesus is with them. And what is astounding is not just that they saw the presence of Jesus, but that others on the outside looked in and saw the presence of Jesus. If you want to influence your world, it is not by living a suffering free life. It is not by avoiding the fiery furnace, but it is by walking through your trials and suffering and rejoicing in them because the presence of Christ is with you. And it is when people see the peace and the freedom and the love and, and, and the stillness and, and the lack of fear that is, is over you and around you because of the presence of Jesus with you. Some of you are, are experiencing that right now. You're going through a fiery furnace and the only thing that's keeping you is that you know that you know that Jesus is with you. Do you see his presence with you? Are you aware? Are you stilling your life enough to, to sense his presence, to live in awareness of him? It doesn't happen. It requires your focus. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I'm God. And listen, if there's ever a place to be still, it is in the middle of a fiery furnace, isn't it? They had nothing else to do. Their responsibilities were on hold. They couldn't run their provinces. They were thrown in the fiery furnace. Their hands were bound. They had one job, and it was to focus on Jesus. Do you know sometimes God has to land us in a fiery furnace in order to get us still enough to experience and notice his presence? Some of us were running around so, I've told you before, we're so busy with the things of life, we just can't imagine stilling ourselves long enough to experience his presence. I read today that John Piper wrote an article and, and it stuck with me and it sort of reinforces a point. It's a political article, but it makes a Christian point. I wanna read you just a little bit of, of what he wrote because I think it's so in line with this as we end this teaching. He says, what, rema what remains for Christians is fines, prison, exile, and martyrdom. Then ask yourself this, he was speaking to pastors, has my preaching, has a pastor's preaching been developing the ideas? Are we real and radical Christians? That's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were. You say, what, what kind of Christians are real and radical Christians? He goes on and says this, they are Christians who can sing on the scaffold or Christians who can sing in the fiery furnace, the words of Martin Luther King's, a mighty fortress that go like this. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. He goes on to write, Christians who will act like the believers in Hebrews 10, 34, that says, you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Christians who will face hate and reviling and exclusion for Christ's sake and yet rejoice in that day and leap for joy for behold, their reward is great in heaven. Are you that kind of radical Christian? Are you choosing to obey God today before the crisis point? Are you willing to go into the fiery furnace if God asks you to, knowing that his presence will be with you no matter what? What is it? What is the stake, the nail that you're willing to die on? Ask to serve God or to bow to the idols in our culture? Are you hanging on to house, reputation, relationships, on earth, some might not even be in your best interest. 
Are you hanging on to security and possessions and toys and all the things that we think matter in life? Or are you turning your back on those and bowing to God Almighty in every area of your life? What area in your life tonight needs to be reevaluated? Maybe it's in your sexuality or your marriage or financially or go on and on. You can think about all the categories that we face. Who are you living for today? And in the point of crisis, are you going to live like those Christians in Hebrews 10, 34? Will you accept the plundering of your property since you yourselves know that we have a better possession and an abiding one? Only the Christian who's focused on Jesus and who's aware of who he is, the character of our Lord, is able to walk without fear and with absolute confidence that even in the fiery furnace, God's presence is with us still. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Those are great words. I pray tonight that you and I would be able to say them with confidence, knowing that our God is able to get us through the fiery furnace. And even if he doesn't, let it be known that we will not serve any other God or worship any other image than Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I hope that's where you are today.